Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Well, good morning. Thank you for uh, for joining us. Uh, we will do a compressed version of the things we were planning to talk about this morning, since our security is is so, so tight for the for the emergency visit. Uh, my name is Robert Harrison. I'm the head of MIT Development with the International Baccalaureate. And with me today is my colleague. Do you want to come stay on the microphone? Uh, my name is Rita Bateson. I'm curriculum manager for mathematics and science at <laughs> the MIT. And today we want to talk with you and actually have you talk with each other and with us a little bit about the experience of reading science and mathematics. So uh, academic literacy and these two subjects, which is really quite important for all of us. We recently uh, conducted a study with the George Washington University in the United States about what are the needs for students particularly who are learning science and math uh, in English when English may not be their first or best language or their mother tongue. So what are the special challenges that we face when students, even if they're learning language, uh, language of science and math, not in English, but in a language that they don't know best. So learners of other languages, when the language of instruction is not their best language, what are the things that we need to be able to do? And there are three big uh, ideas that came from this research study. The first is to be able to support people's literacy in their mother tongue. So if you're learning English um, and you're learning to come to work in science and math in English, it's also good to work in science and math in the language you may know better or with which you're more familiar the language that you use at home. So not just monolingual, but multilingual instruction. That it's okay when you're learning, even if you're taking the IB diploma test in English, it's okay to work toward that goal with all the languages you know. And so you bring what you know from all these languages together. Uh, the second thing is why we are here today is to help teachers prepare their academic language pedagogy. Because learning language is a very complex idea. And when you're learning language and learning content at the same time, it becomes more than twice as complicated. So we're going to be focusing on the second part. And then the third thing we also will touch on this morning, which is to increase instruction in subject-specific language. So there are some special ways of talking and thinking and writing in sciences and mathematics that are different than thinking, talking, writing, and speaking about the arts or talking about history or uh, literature. In this field, there are particular ways of learning language that are not necessarily transferable from one subject group to another. So we're focusing on two and three of these things, trying to put the research into practice. Uh, how many of you are teaching at, at an IB World School now? Are any of you IB teachers or working at an IB school? Good. Thank you for letting us know that. Um, the International Baccalaureate, as you probably know, is uh, a range of programs. And the way we go about thinking about education is like this. We start with the student in the middle. Uh, and the students' needs and the values we want students to develop, we call them a profile. Most of education then talks about this outside piece, right? The curriculum, the stuff that you must teach, the things you need to know about science and math. But for an IB education, we're interested not just in the programs that go from three years old to 19 years old, but are interested especially in how you teach. So it's not just the transmission of content from me to you, but the way that we help you to build your knowledge as a student is also vitally important. And we add one further complication, or I would prefer to say amplification of this idea, is that whenever we're thinking and working with students, we're focusing on multilingualism. That that's a, a right and a resource for our students, and that they can learn the fact that students know multiple languages, even little bits of multiple languages, is important. And science and math, is, is in, the, in essence, it's a language. So the fact that they know anything from what they learned last year is already a language that they bring with them this year. So this multilingualism idea is deeply embedded in the nature of IB programs, and we think that it's really very important. Second language learners are anybody who's learning a language that's not uh, the language that they know first or best. And that happens, I would say, as a history teacher, anytime I go to a science or math class. Because it's not just my language of English, which is my, my, my mother tongue, uh, and I know lots of bits of other little languages, lots of little bits of other languages, including science and math. Anytime I'm working in multiple languages, uh, I have to work on that academic content. And I thought I'd 
might take um, an example just to put you in that place of how it might feel as a second language learner. That this is my first language. This is hopefully nobody knows Irish. Anybody know Gaelic? No? Okay, great. So we're going to take an example of a very simple mathematical task. Something that mathematics teachers think is universal. But if we're talking about method and process, if you had a teacher start saying, as they would do, Kerkalor, who really would have said that? Parry the hip rock, the Dina Sposs and Aeneas. Good Duggan, she'd been fragrant. Tree, four, shay, plus a doe. Came a hang, came a doe. Everybody okay? Good? Oh. Everyone understands that. Oh, yes. no? Oh, I forgot about you, my second language learner. Don't worry. Oops, where that's up. Don't worry, there's your vocab. Okay? Now, try the thing again. I'll say it slowly. Three, four, shape was do, came a hay, fair, the low hair moving, came a do, creek, big on fragra, on fragra. Okay? And this is what happens in many, many of our science classes where the teacher thinks that glossary, perhaps the key terms, in this case the mathematical terms, bracket, trial, test, value, that those words are important. But of course, there are many, many other supporting terms there which are crucial. The steps, for example, the word came a hang is step one. Came a those, step two. And if the student can recognize things, but can't activate their background knowledge, they can kind of figure it out, and, our, and our, perhaps our higher ability students will latch on to if they're mathematically inclined. They will latch on and say, I think I know what is happening here, I will try. But for those students who are overwhelmed by this, a vocabulary list of mathematical terms or scientific terms will not be enough. It will overwhelm them, perhaps, it will undermine them. So if we take an example in a science MYP context, here's a relatively standard examination question. We have our MYP criteria at the top, what we would like the students to achieve, applying scientific knowledge and understanding to suggest solutions to solve problems in an unfamiliar situation. So it's already unfamiliar to the students, even in first language. So they are applying a huge range of skills here. If we look at the question, it's a, it's a relatively standard question about resistance, voltage, and it's got a huge density of text. So I'd like to look at the text analysis for a moment and ask you to maybe speak to the person beside you and say, which words there do you see are science-specific vocab? Which words would you expect to explain to a student as a science teacher? Give me two minutes to discuss. Okay, so please share with me some of the words that you see there that are science specific. Yeah. Which one? Variable. Yeah, variable resistance. Any others? Brightness of the ball. Switches. There are a huge number in there which the science teacher, a good science teacher, will say, these are the words you need to know to access this information, this knowledge. However, if we look at the questions, we have dimmer switch, variable resistance, circuit. These are the words that I would gravitate to naturally, expecting the students need to know that to access the science. However, if we look at the other words in there, change. Brightness, perhaps, students who are a second language learner might understand something different from bright, a capable student, a clever student. They might see, they may never have come across the word control knob before. Thus, our supporting words in between, thus, that may be inaccessible to our students. So it's very important for us to look at the text, even as science teachers, as non-scientists, to take up this intersection between, the back one, our scientific vocabulary and the supporting non-academic vocabulary that you'll find in that question. Because that could be the thing that is stopping the students from accessing the higher level, from being able to showcase what they know. 
Sure. To the scientific or to the non-scientific? Both? Yes. I think so. Absolutely. This can be somewhat of a revelation to science teachers at first to see what it is that they're not seeing that the students do and what these words can mean. Because obviously thus, clockwise and anti-clockwise can be another one. Even as a first language learner, you may have said counterclockwise your entire life. And that could be enough in a test. Uh, observing. As we know, as scientists, observe means something very di different to the everyday use of the word observe. And there are many, many words like this. There are a huge number of words that have such specific meaning in science that we as science teachers think that they're automatic, that they're inherent. And the students don't feel that way. Normal means something very specific to a teenager, but it means something even more specific to a science teacher. And if you say a normal force, they may think average, usual, typical, but we mean something very specific. And that academic language is really what we need to focus on. Their use in reading so that they can write it appropriately, use it appropriately in the future. And there are many, many words in this dangerous region in between. Words that are both everyday non-academic vocabulary and words that have a very specific meaning that are not things like mitosis, meiosis, um, centrifugal, but words that actually have multiple meanings in multiple situations except in the science context. Bias. Bias does not necessarily mean negative in science. Um, value. It hasn't got to do with monetary value, for example. We talk about values a lot in our variables, but does values to our students, does that mean something that is an ethic or a moral? Observing, I said already, a, a crucial one. Discrete. Discrete is not sensitive in, in math. It's not sensitive in science. It's something much, much more specific. So these are the words in this danger region here of our text analysis that I think is very important for our academic proficiency of students. And what we'd like to see is moving away from this idea of a glossary being enough. A list of words in your dictionary and you'll be fine. Just look up the word for, photosynthesis, and we'll be okay. We want students to have more agency in and access to scientific writing so that they can understand that the process, the scientific method, has a method of writing to support that. The overuse of the passive or things like this that we would like to avoid. Students have to be able to understand scientific writing so that we hope in the future they'll be able to produce scientific writing. And the language structures of academic English are very different to the academic English they will see elsewhere in science. <coughs> <All right. coughs> this, this is where we're going to go very fast, and I think the slides will be available after the conference because my part is to give just a little tiny bit of theory before we get into more practical examples from Rita and science teaching. So, uh, are any of you trained linguists? So, have you studied the processes and structures of language before? No? But it's your job to teach them. So, we already have a problem, right? Because you're science teachers and math teachers, and you know about science and math, but actually, all day long, you're teaching language. But we oftentimes don't train teachers in the skills and the understanding and the conceptual theory they need to be able to put it into practice in the classroom. You may have studied a lot about the theory of teaching or the theory of science and math, but the theory of language acquisition, which is really what you're doing all day, every day, we don't really talk about in very effective ways or train teachers uh, to do that. So there are two quick words that, that from the 1980s I'll tell you today. One is Bix and one is Kelp. And they aren't really English words, they're uh, acronyms. Bix stands for Basic Intercultural Communication Skills. And there I would say, think about the way students talk in the playground of the lunchroom or when they, when they go to the conference. So that's the language that we use in the marketplace. Uh, when I moved to the Netherlands, I, I learned how to go to the market and to buy things. I know the names of foods and how to talk to people and how to have a polite conversation about the weather. Because in Dutch, the word for weather is the word, the same word as for the same, because the weather is always the same. So veer is again and veer is the weather, right? Because it's always great. Uh, CALP is a very different thing. Cognitive academic language proficiency is the language you need to be successful in school, not in the getting around the hallways and the talking to your friends and understanding when the homework is due, but the how to write a lab report in a way that gives a good grade for your teacher. 
And you can be very, very, very good at BIC. And when you talk to a student, they think, yes, this student understands English and Arabic and French uh, and Kiswahili and 16 of the languages. They under they're very, very fluent. But actually, in none of those languages is the student cognitively language proficient in academics. And so first of all, understanding these different domains of fluency is important. Um, there are four big ways that we talk about building language, all of which go to this important idea that students, when they are learning language, are in, a, in essence building their identity. And not just their identity as an Arabic speaker or a member of Middle Eastern cultures or uh, somebody who learns how to speak in English, but their identity as scientists and mathematicians. That's also part of our identity, and particularly for the students that you want to go on into more science and math study, until they until they feel competent and confident in the language of science and math, they're not going to do that. So at the heart of this building identity, we have these strategies for building background knowledge, scaffolding, building step by step that goes beyond uh, simply uh, providing glossaries, and then extending language, practicing and playing with the language of science and math. So uh, this is a very complicated diagram. We're going to go through it very fast, but you'll get the idea just by what happens next. These are very complicated relationships. And so what we're doing in the conference and what you're doing uh, and all the things when you're teaching are building skills, your own skills and the skills of students. But what kind of skills and what do you want them to be able to do, right? So some skills are for uh, language skills are for playground and survival. And for some students who are learning even their interactions with you, what it means, the homework to be due tomorrow as opposed to the day after tomorrow. There are some survival skills to get along. And that language isn't particularly scientific, but for second language learners, you have to teach it. It's important. At the same time, you're building skills for the classroom. How do you write an effective report from your lab work? How do you describe the solution that you had for this complicated math problem? How do you tell what happened in words that not only make sense to you, but which your math teacher agree are math kinds of words? You're building these all kinds of skills. When you put those together, you get academic language, which is the purpose of teaching. It's like we want to make the point that all teachers are, first of all, teachers of language. But even that isn't what's enough, because you have to talk about how not just to uh, engage in and be able to write a lab report, but how to read and understand someone else's lab reports. How to read a textbook, how to read a report in the media that, that talks about things in science, and to know whether that's good science or bad science. It's very difficult to tell. And then beyond that, being able to be an active and critical participant in the production of scientific knowledge. That's also really, very important. So all these things are going on at the same time. You're communicating, you're expressing, you're building knowledge, you're evaluating, you're analyzing. And then this are all because language is so complicated, we're all the time learning language, we're all the time learning through language, and we're all the time learning about language. And that's true regardless of whether you're teaching science, math, or English literature, or Arabic literature. All these things are happening at the same time, and they're interacting in very complicated ways. They don't stand still. That's why it's, that's why it's hard to do. And if, even when you think you're teaching about language, you're really learning through language, and you're really thinking about how language works all at the same time. So our point with this is to say that this is a very, very difficult task, which I think as a teaching community, we haven't paid enough attention to. Most of the students in our classes already have fairly complicated language profiles. And they're dealing with language on multiple levels, just in surviving sometimes, much less being able to be critical thinkers about science and math. And so this is a topic that really has a lot of uh, currency in which we need to be able to do. This one is specific to the, I, oh, sorry. This one is obviously specific to Ivy School, so I apologize if you're not in an Ivy School, but I hope you find something of use. Over the, a series of meetings at the IB, we had a lot of uh, we had practitioners, teachers, um, researchers come together and, and build for us a framework of, to support those subjects, mathematics and sciences particularly, where this academic language could be further supported. And this framework it was determined that the important skills that they need to know, not just in language acquisition, but in acquiring mathematical language and acquiring scientific language, 
were listening skills, speaking, interacting, reading, writing, and thinking. And if you step back for a second, these are also the skills that our first language learners need too, because they also need to acquire the ability to write academically in, about science and write academically about mathematics and, and read and so on. So all of those skills could be applied to first language learners, although we're talking exclusively about second language learners today. And the pedagogy behind them is this process by which we can activate, not ignore, their background knowledge. That we allow them to express what they know in their own first language or what they've learned in other contexts and situations. And by activating and building up this background knowledge, we put them in a place of security so that they can then take in the new input, be it vocabulary, be it writing structures, templates, whatever it is that you'd like them to engage with. They can process this input by doing an activity, by carrying out a, a, a task, or a lesson plan may be specifically addressing this. And then hopefully we'll get a com comprehensible output, which could be assessed or could be formatively or summatively assessed. And for extending them into proficiency, then we hope to see it demonstrating and applying. And this was the framework that was developed for this, but of course it could be modified, it's just a suggestion. Um, and along the top you'll see the pedagogy, which we just talked through there, the background knowledge, our scaffolding, which Robert had in his diagram earlier, and then the extended academic language proficiency. I'm going to show you some examples, one from Diploma, which is our older students, and one from Middle Years Program. One for science, one for mathematics. So just to give you a quick insight as to how they look, I'll skip this because we're running out of time. We'll come back to that. So, our biology example. This is one of the teacher support materials for the CAL. And it's an activity that's embedded in a lesson. It's actually over a series of lessons, some of them. But this one is for language acquisition with plas um, plasma membranes. Yeah, it's moving particles across a plasma membrane, which in itself is not an easy thing to teach. And then you add additional needs. And you get a very complex situation where you design an activity and almost every student will benefit anyway. It's a reinforcement for some, it's a processing for others. And in this example, it's a very simple card matching exercise. And it has some instructions, this is available obviously for IB schools on the OCC website. So let's cut out the cards, give the students one of the shaded cards from the left hand. And those choices are osmosis, simple diffusion, and so on. And on the right hand side, we'll see permeable membrane, concentration gradients, all associated words with some or one of those terms. And the instruction says, ask the students to add all of the cards that apply to this card. So they can choose from all of them. They're activating a huge amount of background knowledge. They're processing new input because they may or may not have seen all of these words and they have to analyze. And they may need further support with the dictionary and so on. And this is how it will look on our framework. By doing the build-up activities on transport, the learning engagements, students will have heard about transport, learned about transport, read about these particles. The matching will then be a new input for their reading skills. Matching the cards will be processing, and then they should be able to create workable definitions for themselves, defined by themselves and designed for each other as their comprehensible output. And then it's up to the teacher to decide how they may wish to demonstrate and apply that knowledge. Perhaps a test, perhaps a project, a practical investigation, something similar. For the middle years program, the resources include things like, it's, it's a more of a bundle. It's an activity, a lesson plan, there's supporting pedagogy, extensions, appendices, and so on. So I'm going to show you just a small window into that package. The teachers are given a beginning of a unit plan, not the entire unit planner because that has to, so much has to be defined by the school and decided by the teachers and the students. So they get the introduction for a unit plan in which this could be used. The teacher is also given goals and possible outcomes, all of which can be adapted. And several steps. So try this first with the students. While these students are doing this, you could do that. You could take this out, ask them to feed back, collaborate, lots of ATL skills and their approaches to learning skills embedded in there. And at this point, the students can share with one another the words in their own language, so we're bolstering our international mindedness. 
Um, and as you can see, our activities cross many, many of, the, of these necessary strands and skills. So those are, let's see if I can find an example. No, I didn't include this, but it, it comes with worksheets, it comes with tables, and so on. So they can be adapted and used by teachers. Mm -hmm. so, rush through the yeah, so we, uh, we're, we're going to play a little language game with you in a moment, but I just want to go back to, to this example from, um, from Teacher's Board. How many of you have used flashcards in teaching, right? And is anybody willing to tell me how you use them? If I were a student and I had flashcards, what would you tell me to do? Yeah, I'm usually, if there's something that goes in the order, like the steps or something. Yeah, so you can sequence things, yes? Sequence. Yeah, so the respiration cycle, yeah. making sure you have yeah, prophase and anaphase in the right ball ball. Yeah, I have them make it, but they don't number them. Okay. And they exchange it to the pastor, like the other student is supposed to number them to the right here. Okay, so sequencing is a good yeah. thing. Somebody else use flashcards in a different way? Yes. And recognizing the different parts of the microscope. So basically they have a microscope with so labels, labels, with labels and that you can move and around. they have the names, and they have the functions, and they have to put them all together. Yeah, very good. Anybody have a different way you use flashcards? <laughs> For classification. <laughs> yeah, so you, you put all, you, it has a big top and then you sort them out. Yes? Anyone have a different way? So as a review. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So they're good, they're good revision tools also, right? There, there are hundreds of ways to use them, obviously, but when we're talking about this sort of language production, it also, you, you can carry that further with the teaching of language, so that it's not simply a labeling ex exercise, but once you have these cards sorted in the, you, you have the gray one, the sorts of white ones beside the gray one, yes? Then to make a sentence that uses all those words, or to use all those words in a paragraph describing the larger process, or to have a student who comes up with a different set of words, which also might be correct to have a discussion between the students to compare the two sentences that, that they've built, right? Or to, uh, if there is a process that includes more than one word, making sure you have double sets of cards so that students can draw links between the processes <laughs> to see that this goes with that, and then to write and talk about, first to talk about and then to write a description of how those processes are the same and different. So we push the use of a really common teaching method into a language instruction and thinking process as well. So it's not just, all of those are great ideas, but we can push them farther by increasing our skills and thinking about the fact that just um, what one of the problems that students often have is they confuse um, recognizing something with understanding it, right? It's a very common uh, thing for beginning, for beginning, beginning learners of any subject. And so they think that they can label the parts of the microscope, but if you ask them to describe in a paragraph the parts of the microscope and how they work together as a system, then they have difficulty doing it. Yes, that, that's typical. So how you move from this first level of what I would call survival academic language to much more critical examples of saying, please describe to me the differences between a light and an electron microscope. Right? The, the, that, that's a much more complicated question, but it's still a language question. And we can take typical, everyday, low-cost teacher tools and push those things into a, another level of, of skills. Before you move on, I just noticed there, also with that lens you talked of earlier, that even there we can see opportunities <coughs> for stopping the perpetuation of misconceptions. So we have pump up there, for example, but straight away that would be an important point of clarification. A pump can mean one thing, but in this case it's a very specific scientific meaning. Um, water maybe not so much, but channel also. So there is, there is that possibility to extend so that we don't have these recognition misconceptions carrying on the whole time with the students. Uh, and that's a good example also of background knowledge. Students will know what a channel is, right? And they might even know that a channel is like, and not just on the television or the radio or the, um, or the internet, but it also might, uh, or the YouTube, right? But it, but it, might, but it might be something that's in the, in the ground where water flows along. So building on those things is a good idea. Right. I'm supposed to leave that. Yeah, okay. So let, let's try this game because I'd like, I'd like to give you a little test to see if you learned something from our uh, course of course. So uh, here's, uh, here's a scientific diagram, right? Uh, I'm going to be a, a student who doesn't speak science, right? And then I want you to talk to somebody near you and get the scientific translation of what I'm saying. 
Okay? Right. So, I see a line going up and a line going over, and it has numbers with little dots, and it has pho and coax and centuries, and it goes up a little bit, and then it goes over and over, and it goes up, 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 up really fast, and then it goes a little bit over, and then it's straight and it stops. Okay? That is all true, yes? And it's perfectly an English sentence you could understand, but it's meaningless for science. So, would you practice giving a scientific explanation of what I just said to someone sitting near you, in English or Arabic, or whatever language you would like? Now, because you're science teachers, you could probably talk all day on this. Yes, so you, can take a, you, 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 could, you could take a whole lesson, maybe a whole unit, maybe a whole year to talk about this diagram. Uh, and, but the thing is that having asked you to put it in the scientific language, I then actually could see you thinking. I, I can see you. People were laughing, people were talking, people were disagreeing, people were saying yes and yes. And so that process of the discussion among scientists, you're experts. But students can also, you can pose a problem like that, right? You can pretend to be stupid, like I just pretended to be, although it was not much of a pretending for me about science. Uh, but you would be able to ask students to translate this. So instead of saying the line goes up, I would say that's the, the vertical axis, right? Instead of saying there's a line that goes over, I would say it is a horizontal axis, right? And uh, this is a Cartesian plane, and there's a matter of scale, and there's a matter of uh, great gradients, right? Oh, lots of words you could use. And then it's not th, right? It's not the word. It's pH, well, that, okay, but still, pH rather than LZ or ML or whatever, right? So you can talk about that. It's not a, it's not a sum three, right? Yeah, it's a cubic something. Where do you see the word cubic there? Right? It's nowhere, but you know what it means. So we already have a, a translation issue, the same as if we were speaking Irish. If it's you're speaking science. And I said the line kind of goes up and goes, oh, really fast and goes over, right? What would you say? It's, it's reached a state of equilibrium. But do you see reached state or equilibrium on this graph? Yeah. It, you don't see that there. But you know that because you know the words to use. I've described it one way. You've described it using science language, but we're describing the same thing. We're reading it using scientific language. We know what that jumps means. We know that, that that rapid increase in gradient, or I mean, we can tell what that means to us as scientists. So we're not just describing it, but we're actually really deep into what the graph tells us. And, and you made a very good point about the context. We don't know what it's being, the volume's added to, <coughs> we don't know what the solution might be. So those things are, are coloring what we see in the graph, and that the students may not see, and more likely won't see until it's been yeah. illustrated. But you want them to do that level of critical scientific literacy that they will ask the questions that you want to know about this graph because it's so decontextualized, right? But as soon as you pull it out and put it on a test and say to me, tell me what this graph means for 12 points, right? If I, what I said, and I said it means that something, something happened, that's a true statement, but it's not enough for science. So our point is that all teachers are language teachers, Science and maths has a very important and specific topic. And our goal is to move people toward applying and demonstrating. Because we really want not people, you know, it's nice to know the parts of the microscope. Yes, this is a good thing to know. Yes, why not? However, 
that's not something that's really useful for life, knowing the parts of the microscope. It's how you how that part might interact with the thing you're looking at to tell you something scientific you actually want to know. So being part of a meaningful conversation, right? Being able to decode a, te a, a text, to be able to read a study in the newspaper and think, yes, that's very good science, or that's very questionable science. The conclusion that they came to is wrong because they don't understand how a microscope works. That's the sort of discussion you want. And then you want to be able to write not only for your teacher, but so that your friends can understand what it is you're talking about in science. In science. So, we have very little time for questions, and you're ready for your coffee. I just have, yes? I just have one moment of inspiration. If yep. you are interested in the scientific writing aspect, particularly in science, Stephen Pinker's Jungle Book is an excellent book on uh, scientific writing, common sense and scientific writing, that could be interesting further reading for your teachers. Common sense for scientific writing. I think it's called making sense, but if you look up Stephen Pinker, it's in 2014. And so Rita and I will be having coffee nearby. If you'd like to talk to us some more about this, we'd be happy to talk to you more about science and mathematical literacy. And we thank you very much for coming this morning. Please enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.